I'm going to cover the topic of Easter this week. I think it's very appropriate because it's going to set up a nice lesson for the following week where the focus can be on the real spiritual importance of Easter. But I'm going to lay down some precepts today that I think are a great preface in going into this time of year. Please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 33 and 34. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. This really captures Easter in a perfect sense, this exchange between Peter and Jesus Christ, because Peter represents the best of our intentions. We as Christians desire to follow Jesus Christ. Of course, that's why we became Christians. Uh, Peter was a zealot. Peter, with all of his heart, wanted to do the right thing, but he had not yet been permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So he wound up failing, and his failures set up great lessons for everyone else. So I'm very thankful for Peter and the lessons that God teaches us uh, by Peter's great zeal and yet falling short because without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. Okay, so uh, I wanted to capture this moment, this exchange, because it, as I said, sets up this lesson perfectly. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a brief Easter quiz. And I really am hoping that everyone watching this video will learn something as a result of this quiz, or it will inspire people to think a little deeper on the topic. And then I'm going to cover what does Easter mean in a literal sense. And then I'm going to talk about Easter in a spiritual sense. That's important because Christians are reborn of God's Spirit and they're spiritual creatures in Christ who discern spiritual things, uh, not only natural things. And then I'm going to comment at some point, what have I heard from, I'm just guessing, approximately 80% of professing Christians regarding Easter. I'll, I'll mention that at some point today. And what does God's Word say about Easter? And what does the Pope and some modern Bibles say where Easter is found in God's Word? I think that's important to understand. The reason the books of the Apocrypha were placed between the Old and New Testaments is to sharpen our reproof skills. You put Babylonian canon between God's Word and it sharpens our reproof skills. So um, I'm going to comment on that. And then next week I'm going to talk about the resurrection, ascension, the comforter for believers that are released from prison by our Lord Jesus Christ, because that's important, and it really is a joyful topic. But I'm going to do that next week because I think that's completely appropriate based on what is being covered. So question, what does the Word of God say about Easter? Ask yourself, Easter is a word does not appear in the Bible. I've heard this from probably about 80% of professing believers. So is that the right answer? Easter is described in the Bible to plainly indicate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've also heard this from people that profess to be believers. Easter is in the Bible only once and describes a great feast of celebrating life in the consumption of hams, eggs, candies, and rabbits. Believe it or not, I have heard that from professing believers. Easter appears once in the Bible as a time between Peter's imprisonment and intended death. 
I think I've heard this from professing believers as well. And then Easter is not the correct translation. It should be Passover. Truly, I've heard this from the vast majority of people that identify as Christians, and maybe they haven't been born again. But this is the most common response that I hear, especially from people that have high opinions of themselves, and have come out of theology studies, seminaries. They think they're smart, uh, and uh, they've, they've got it all figured out. So this is the most common response that about 80% of all professing believers have told me. I'm just giving an estimate. So what is the correct answer here? Because if we're going to celebrate Easter as Christians, we all need to understand what we're celebrating. So what does the Word of God say about Easter? Easter appears once in the Bible as a time between Peter's imprisonment and intended death. That is the correct answer. And if you're a Christian and you're witnessing to someone and they ask you about Easter, you, you need to give them a biblical response. You don't want to go based on what you've heard from ear-tickling sermons, what you've heard from the televangelist, what you've heard in pop culture, what you've heard from the graduates of theology. You want to know what Jesus Christ has taught you out of the pure, unbroken scripture that he's delivered unto us. So this is the truth. Easter appears once in the Bible, and it is as a time between Peter's imprisonment and intended death. So when is Easter? Easter is a time in April following Nisan and is usually the second or third Sunday. Easter is a time from March 1st through April 30th that rotates Sundays based on Passover. Easter is the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. Easter is based on the Christian Mardi Gras, see Isaiah 22 and 1 Timothy chapter 4, and follows six weeks or approximately afterwards. So when is Easter? Which one of these is the correct answer? Uh, and I'm just going to pause and let everyone reflect on this for a minute. It's nothing to be embarrassed about, but if you're a Christian, you need to understand when is Easter? How is it calculated? Uh, and I celebrate Easter with great joy with my family. And I'm just going to say that this is a, uh, a topic to be joyful about if you're born again of the Spirit and to have great hope about if you're not. But we have to know when is Easter. So when is Easter? Easter is the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. That's how it's calculated. So if we've got Easter coming up, let's say on April 17th, it means that it's the first Sunday after the full moon following March 21st. So um, probably a good portion of true Christians know how Easter is calculated, but for everyone's sake, I just wanted to do this as a review because I don't want to give sermon lessons for any other reason than to make sure people know what God's Word says and what the truth of the matter is in all aspects of these holidays that are being celebrated. So I'm going to go to God's Word. In Acts chapter 12, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. This is where Easter is so critical in God's word. It's mentioned once in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. And I'm going to talk about this a little more, but 
Easter is clearly a time that was around the Jewish Passover, but it is different, completely different from the Jewish Passover. My Jesuit Reims Bible references the word Easter I, over 60 times between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Never once in the canon of Scripture, but 60 times it's referenced in the 1610 Jesuit Reims Bible that I have. So um, contrast that to what is taught today. Easter and the Passover occur in similar times, uh, but they are different. So I want to make that very clear. And they're different. If you go back 400 years ago, everybody agreed that Passover and Easter were different. I'm going to continue on reading verses 5 through 7. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. So as we read God's word and study it, there's a great lesson going on here. Remember Peter told Jesus, I'm ready to go to prison. I am ready to go to prison. And yet, as soon as he said that, and he meant it, he wound up denying Jesus Christ three times as Jesus told him. Uh, and as everyone that has read God's word should know, Jesus chastened Peter afterwards, after his resurrection, uh, you know, by asking Peter, you know, uh, three times, do you love me, Peter? And if you do, you know, uh, follow me and feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And then Peter is also being cast into prison. And it's as a lesson, it's not just as punishment from God, but it's a lesson for all of us that um, there is going to be a great lesson of hope here that in, without God intervening, Peter is going to be killed. He's in prison. He's uh, behind bars. He's got uh, you know fetters on him, and there is no escape. But God is going to make him free from these chains that are on him. I'm going to go back to the topic of Passover. I'm just going to say it comes once a year on one day, the 14th of Abib. You can reference the scriptures I have on the screen. And then, you know, after the Passover, then comes the seven days of unleavened bread. These are all very important lessons because they foreshadow Jesus Christ, who is ultimately the spiritual Passover. Okay, but it's important to understand that during Peter's imprisonment, the Jews who were celebrating Passover, they did not receive Jesus Christ. Uh, the Jews and the Romans had him killed. Okay, those that received Jesus Christ are being persecuted. So the Jewish Passover, according to the book of Hebrews, is not adequate anymore because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. He is ultimately the only acceptable offering for sin. So the law has been fulfilled and the Jewish Passover is still being celebrated by non-believers and yet there is a separate event called Easter that is mentioned while Peter is in prison. So Peter was arrested during the days of the unleavened bread. Passover had come and gone. This means that Easter is the correct word that should be rendered in Acts chapter 12 verse 4. The Bible says that Herod was going to bring him forth after Easter, which had not come yet. The angel of the Lord rescued Peter in response to the prayers of the church, who were gathered together praying for Peter after they heard that James had been killed. The Bible says in Acts chapter 12, verse 19, that the keepers of the prison were put to death by Herod for Peter's escape from prison. In Acts chapter 12, verse 23, the angel of the Lord struck Herod, and he was eaten by worms and died because people were, uh, you know, saying this is God or, you know, they, they, 
there was no acknowledgement of the Most High God, so Herod was struck down. He was trying to be to the people uh, their deity, their supreme ruler. And I invite everyone to read Acts chapter 12 and to also study the other parts of Scripture that I'm referencing. But this is just a quick synopsis. Other, I've seen other ministries write up a similar apologetic. I've used content from other people's synopsis for what happened during Easter to create my own kind of custom synopsis here. Okay, but this is how I understand it, having read God's word. Easter in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 referred to a pagan event which was around the time following the Jewish Passover. Peter was no longer a Jew, so Herod was not concerned about upsetting the Jews by killing him during the feast days of the unleavened bread. Rome and the Jews had killed Jesus during the feast days, see Luke chapter 22. Herod was going to wait until after Easter to kill Peter. Um, so this is biblical Easter. And uh, it's important to understand that. But it's also important to understand spiritual Easter because in that there is great hope and joy. And that's really what I celebrate. But you have to understand what Easter means from a natural sense as well, from a biblical sense, to have a complete appreciation for the spiritual sense. So what did Bible say during times of persecution? These were based on Hebrew and Greek, not the Latin of Rome. Okay, so uh, the translation in the book of Acts would have been from Koine Greek. Uh, William Tyndale said Easter, phonetically Easter. Coverdale, Easter. Cranmer, uh, East Eater, it said. Geneva Bible of 1557 says Easter. Very important because I think it was later changed to line up with the teachings of Rome. And I've commented that I believe the true Geneva Bible is the one that was ultimately compiled completely in 1560. The Bishop's Bible says Easter. The authorized version of 1611, which overcame the gunpowder plot by the grace of God, says Easter. So there is no debate. Easter has always been the word choice to differentiate from Passover or equivalent in Acts chapter 12. So what does the Luther Bible say? I've talked in the past about how much I was taught about Luther and the Catholic Church's hatred for him uh, because he was the, the chief villain that broke up the Catholic Church and then ultimately caused... Uh, a lot of the subsequent strategic planning sessions to reel everyone back in under the spiritual power of the papacy. Of course, they never really laid that out for me when I was growing up Catholic, but King James and Luther were two names that certainly stood out to me as enemies of the Church of Rome from my youth. Uh, the Luther Bible says this, I have a friend that is a, a German uh, German is their first language, but they speak English and German perfectly. You would never know um, that this person has German as their first language. That's how well they speak English. Uh, but it says, intending after Easter to bring him to the people. Uh, and this is from Google Translate, but I believe at some point I confirm that the Luther Bible does say Easter with this person I know from Germany. And I'm talking about the original Luther Bible. Okay, the Jesuit Dewey Reims Bible says Pash, which I understand to be synonymous with Passover. But as I mentioned earlier, there's I over 60 references throughout the Jesuit Reims Bible to Easter. That is a separate word that they talk about, and the Catholic Church is big on basing a lot of their celebrations and events or apologetics on Easter as opposed to Passover. So that's important to understand. Um, Vatican Manuscript Influence Revised Version of 1885 uh, says Passover. Uh, the American Standard Version of 1901, which was also heavily influenced by Vatican Manuscript, uh, says Passover. 
the Revised Standard Version, which the Catholic Church also adopts their own unique version of this as an official Catholic Bible, says Passover. The New American Standard Bible by Freemason uh, Dewey Lockman, Franklin Dewey Lockman, based on the American Standard Version, version says Passover. And Freemasonry and Catholicism, to me, are one and the same. Um, somebody that I know that was a 90th degree Freemason, I've talked to this person a num quite a few times, uh, clearly told me the Jesuits uh, created Freemasonry as part of a, uh, a way to capture uh, well-intending people to come under the power of the papacy. The NIV, 1973, says Passover. The New King James Version, 1982, Passover. Uh, some of these Bibles have subsequent revisions to them, and they change a lot of words. So I can't keep up with every revision of every Bible. It's possible that they could have changed some of these terms to something different, but I've captured the word Passover in at least one of the versions of these many, many, many lamps. So almost all Bibles published after 1611 have Passover instead of Easter, based on my own personal research. Could it be that these are the lamps referenced in Job chapter 41, verse 19? Well, I think they are, because there's much confusion, and God is not the author of confusion. If we settle an English testimony that the Christians believe is unbroken in 1611, why do we need subsequent revisions, and who is generating these subsequent revisions? Where Where is the need coming from? All the grievous printing errors? Well, you know, I took two years to go through and compare uh, the entire 1611 Bible to the, the one that's commonly called the King James, and I have a long, long, long list of deviations, and quite frankly, my conclusion is 1611 is the Word of God in English, and I don't see that many so-called printing errors. Uh, a lot of these are fallacies that are taught to people. Uh, I think everything in the 1611 happened exactly as God had purposed it, and these people were under great persecution, and um, they did everything they could through prayer and faith to get God's word into English as they could. Of course, God allowed them to have uh, some level of fallibility to show that men will always fail without God. But it is an unbroken testimony. There are a couple of appearances, a small amount that appear to be printing errors, but they don't bother me at all. The Holy Spirit has never found a problem with them. I know what the word should mean. I don't try to correct the words because I want to see the, uh, the Bible as it was put together by people of great faith under heavy persecution, uh, given the resources that God had provided them with no deviation from it. Uh, because those people uh, paid a huge price and God had intended it that way. So again, I have a deep appreciation for the 1611 Bible because I've been through it. So I, I have been over to England. I've seen the, uh, the third copy that was ever made. And I've talked to the curators in private. And uh, it, it is a magnificent work of love between God and men, getting his word into the English language for our sakes. The real meaning of Easter, a time to be released from prison. Peter was in prison during Easter. The righteous visit those in behemoth's prison, see Isaiah chapter 14 and Job chapter 40, because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law through his death, resurrection, and ascension. The truth will make them free. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Lamb of God, and he is also the Passover that will free people in the prison of their natural state. So the Passover is going to free people during their natural state, which I will call Easter. Okay, they're two separate things spiritually, they're two separate things literally. And that is important to understand because it says in Job chapter 40, regarding the king of Babylon, 
His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. If you've ever read God's word, the Holy Spirit should be teaching you spiritual vocabulary, and you should be associating brass and iron with corruption. Because God talks about this extensively, I give a couple examples down at the bottom of the screen. You can see Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 28, and Job chapter 41, verse 27, as just two of many places that train us on brass and iron representing corruption. And the bones represent scriptures. Okay, so if you've got, uh, uh, you know, strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron, God is just teaching us that because of the doubt that people have on the word of God, going back to Genesis chapter 3, yea, hath God said, we are all born unto trouble, captive in a prison spiritually, until the truth makes us free, until we're born again of God's spirit. And when we're born again of God's spirit, in Psalm 107, it says, For he hath broken the gates of brass, and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Now, I read iron, it's spelled with a Y there, but I don't think anything of it. That's just the way that the word is spelled in God's word. Once I was able to get through the initial difference, to me, it's I don't even think about it anymore. But it's important that we have the correct testimony because God will teach us what's going on. Now, your typical theology person or person that graduates from a seminary or your typical pastor in the pulpit that went to a seminary, I'm not speaking for everyone, but they will read Job chapter 40 and they're going to be thinking about dinosaurs and hippopotamuses and how dense their bones are and how God made all these great beasts. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they can sit with the kindergartners in Bible class uh, in church because they're, if they're saved, they are on milk, not solid food. They're seeing a simple testimony because they hear plain speech and they're happy with the simplicity of the word. Once you get born again and God starts teaching you spiritual things, now you recognize that simply saying that, look, Lucifer is full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. He's so far more powerful than humans that you can't overcome him. You have 0% chance. Only the truth can make you free. Once you receive the Holy Spirit and you're feeding off the true word of God, God's going to tell you that, look, the scriptures are corrupt, Lucifer's behind this, and then his Antichrist is going to decree these uh, corrupt scriptures and flood the world and hold everyone captive, and only few are going to get saved, and this is all a lesson in Job chapter 40 and 41. That's what's going on. Uh, and even the Catholic Church, back at the time of the Jesuit Reims Bible, their notations regarding behemoth and leviathan referenced the devil because somebody had some basic discernment and God obviously called people during the Reformation out of the Catholic Church. So even the Jesuit Reims Bible acknowledged what the truth or what the teaching is regarding behemoth and leviathan, the devil and antichrist. But today, what does the Catholic Church teach? A lot of their Bibles talk about hippopotamuses and crocodiles and just, you know, stuff that is, uh, you know, beyond laughable to a saved Christian that has the truth that made them free from the captivity of the spiritual prison of Lucifer known as Behemoth. Okay, so I wanted to thoroughly comment on that. Because Easter, spiritually, is a time of celebration for people that have been made free by the truth. And I wanted to put this slide together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. That's kind of the spiritual prison that everyone is born into. But yet God punches a hole and allows people to escape this prison. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. And I put a reminder down at the bottom of 
what God is talking about spiritually. So I wanted to put a visual here because I think it's important. Next week I will discuss Jesus Christ, the crucifixion, death, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Holy Spirit to believers. I can't just talk about the crucifixion, death, and resurrection alone because that's an important part, but it's not everything. What is really important to understand about Easter is also that Jesus Christ tells us not only is he going to be resurrected, but he has to ascend and then he will send us the Holy Spirit from the Father to those that are in behemoth's prison to free them during the time we'll call of spiritual Easter. Okay, the time of our captivity, the time before we get saved. Okay, so this completes the spiritual meaning of Easter for Christians. This is a time and topic of great joy for true believers. It is also a time of great hope for those that are still in prison. There is great hope. There's great joy. But at the end of the day, you either believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or you don't. So I wanted to present something which is probably a lot different than you'll hear from many people that are pastors or, let's say, teachers in the Christian church because the 1611 Bible is unique and the teachings are unique to the 1611 Bible. And the discernment is going to be unique to those that have been given eyes to see and ears to hear. So uh, I'm going to look forward to covering this great topic again next week, um, talking about the crucifixion, death, resurrection, ascension, and ultimately the sending of the Holy Spirit to believers and the great hope that exists for those that have not yet been saved. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll look forward to the next presentation.